Um, we try to defend dubbing, which is seen as uncool, it's seen as something um, without much social value. And we try to show that, on the other hand, uh, it does have social value because there are people, for example, with uh, problems just seeing, visual, visually impaired, but not visually imp impaired because they have some kind of disability, but just simply because after the age of about 35, your, your sight seems to begin to diminish, and so you have problems reading uh, a sub on a, on a smartphone or on a tablet. So the dubbing would give an advantage, and then there are people perhaps who haven't studied much and don't know languages, and so um, a dub is preferable. We looked at the history of dubbing very quickly, um, of, of how uh, the Americans tried to sell their films to Europe, but at the same time in Europe, um, Paramount, Americans again, had uh, started up a studio in Joinville where multiple versions of films were made. Um, and then, um, because of the Second World War, um, there, there were problems with, with dubbing, and so in, in Italy, for example, we had to have Italian actors uh, doing the dubs, uh, Laurel Hardy in particular. Uh, and, and then we talked about how some of the main actors in the audiovisual sectors have now started to uh, have uh, national products uh, dubbed into English, so to, as to expand the, uh, the audiences that will uh, watch them, and how there are many uncharted territories still in audiovisual translation studies, one of them being still the perception of dubbing, not only in Italy, which is what we, the study that we carried out a few years ago, Lila uh, Chiara and I, but also in terms of the target audiences that are involved and how very often they are underestimated, although now social media uh, gives them a way to express their opinion and voice their uh, outrage or their disappointment in how these products are adopted into English.